Uh, really excited today to host a virtual field day highlighting the Upsi Upper Wapsi Finnegan uh, Watershed Management Authority. <laughs> Sorry, it's a mouthful there. But I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and thank you for attending previous virtual field days and providing your feedback for via our evaluation process. Uh, we'd like to feature these in-field videos uh, during each of our virtual field days to provide a sense of place and, and give the speakers an opportunity to share things that they might not otherwise uh, looking at still photographs. So a little bit about the Iowa Learning Farms, if you're not familiar with us. Uh, we were established in 2004 and our goal is to build a culture of conservation by working with farmers and researchers to implement practices that improve water quality and soil health while remaining profitable. These virtual field days and our other outreach efforts are made possible through our partnerships, and that includes the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, US EPA Section 319, Conservation Districts of Iowa, the Iowa Farm Bureau, Practical Farmers of Iowa, GrowMark, the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance, Iowa Corn, and the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. So thank you to all of them for helping sponsor Iowa Learning Farms um, over the years and continuing to do so um, as we approach these virtual platforms uh, for field days. So just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we do ask that you remember to stay muted while the video is playing, uh, but then you'll be invited to unmute to ask your questions. You'll also be able to submit your questions at any time via the chat box, so feel free to do so. Following today's event, uh, we will be emailing you a brief evaluation to take about five minutes uh, to give us some feedback about how the event went um, and also an opportunity to let us know maybe some future topics that you'd like to hear about as well. So this is just the start of the conversation. Uh, luckily with the virtual platform, we do have the opportunity to record and make this available after the fact. So if you know folks that were interested but couldn't join us today, the link to this recording will be in that evaluation email as well. Uh, you can also sign up to receive one of our free Iowa Learning Farms net gators if you wish uh, by completing that evaluation as well. So today we're going to be uh, visiting virtually the upper Wapsipinicon River watershed. Um, for those of you outside of Iowa, uh, kind of giving you a sense of place, uh, it's in Northeast Iowa and it's part of the Iowa watershed approach which, which brings together local, state, federal and private organizations to address factors that contribute to floods and nutrient flows. It's supported by US Housing and Urban Development or HUD dollars. Uh, this model leverages the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy to make communities more resilient to flooding and help improve water quality. So this particular Watershed Management Authority was established in 2015 and received that HUD funding in 2016. Uh, I've got a great panel of speakers for you today. Uh, they include Tori Nimrod and Ross Evelsizer. Um, they are the watershed coordinators for this particular project um, located with the Northeast Iowa Resource Conservation and Development Office. And then we also have Luke Monet and Daniel Jansen. They're engineers at Shive Hattery, uh, the agriculture and, or excuse me, architecture and engineering firm in Des Moines. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, put myself on mute and get to this video. Uh, my name is Ross Evelsizer. I'm one of the watershed coordinators with the uh, Upper Wapsie Watershed Management Authority. And we're just uh, going to take a look at a few projects that are part of the Iowa Watershed Approach Project, which is a statewide project um, that started here in Iowa f a few years ago um, to help build resiliency uh, across nine watersheds in the state. Uh, so the state received about $96 million to work on these projects. And, um, and that went for planning, um, hydrologic modeling, and then implementation. And so the projects that we're going to look at today are going to be some of those projects that were implemented through these dollars. So we're partnering with the Upper Wapsie Watershed Management Authority, and that was a group that formed in 2014 uh, with the goal of restoring flood resilience to the Wapsie watershed as well as improving water quality. And that group is made up of uh, communities and soil and water districts and, and county boards of supervisors, and there's 32 board members on, on that group. So we know that um, there's many ways that we can 
can handle uh, trying to mitigate flooding. Um, and the best projects or the most effective projects seem to be those that we can put in the upper parts of the watershed. And so the project behind me you can see is one of, of many that we're going to put in. I believe there's 28 actually that will be installed as part of this project. And the goal there is to put a network of distributed storage out on the landscape that will help uh, collect heavy rainflow events and, and keep those out of, of the streams and rivers during, you know, at, right after a heavy rainfall. And eventually that water will be allowed to, to drain out to the river as it would normally, uh, but do so in a way that's not going to cause flash flooding. My name is Tori Nimrod. I'm the other WAP, Upper Wapsie Watershed Project Coordinator. And I, I'm, throughout the watershed, there are, like Ross said, 28 different projects um, that are going to be implemented. They range from detention ponds, uh, wetlands, oxbow restorations, grass waterways, and wascob structures. Um, and then of those 28, this is one of them. This is a Quasquitan uh, wetland project. It drains about 10 acres of upland um, land. And it all collects down at the bottom of this pond, which holds about six feet of water when it's full. Um, that really helps flooding benefits because during heavy rainfalls, as it's like six to seven inches or even less, um, this pond will fill up and then that holds back those flash flows so it reduces the impact on the downstream landowners and kind of reduces the flash flooding effect that often Quasquitan has problems with. Um, so a lot of those projects, the other 28, do similar things. Um, they all are focused on reducing flash flows and holding back water up, or up in the watershed so that way um, I guess it just lowers flooding. This project was constructed this summer, um, so it was actually completed earlier this summer when we had very wet weather. And so when they were trying to plant, it was very swampy. And so they did plant it to some natives, but right now you see a lot of just um, volunteer grasses that have come up. But over time, those natives will eventually establish and the weeds will go down with some management from the city. They'll continue to mow it um, in the coming years. And after a couple of years, more natives will come up, so it'll look more like that. Um, natural wetland look that you're used to seeing. So this project will have a lot of wildlife benefits. So pollinators, um, once uh, the plants get established and they start flowering, they will uh, be a benefit to pollinators, um, which include bees, monarch butterflies, birds, um, and various other pollinators. It also provides um, habitat for nesting birds as well with the tall grass, and also a water source for, for the wildlife as well. Uh, there are also water quality benefits to this uh, wetland, um, as mo most wetlands. Um, as water flows down, the sediment will collect in the basin, and so that way if it has time to filter down, um, as well as other nutrients like nitrates and things like that. Once that water is held back, the nutrients will have time to settle and collect in the basin before that water then is released downstream. So landers can get involved right now this project. Um, our implementation dollars for the Upper Wapsi IWA project are estimated to be spent um, and all of these 28 projects have to be implemented by next December 2021. And so, but as a landowner right now, you can always talk to your local SWCD offices and NRCS offices and get involved with um, implementing any water quality or flood reduction practices. A lot of the time, the water quality practices practices also do have flood benefits, reduction benefits as well. I'm Chad Staten. I'm the mayor of Quasquitan. Um, we have a town of 554 here that we settle along the banks of the Wapsipenican. Um, over the last uh, many, many years, we've had many problems with flooding and flash flooding in town. Um, the whole town uh, drains about 30 to 60 acres of ground. This project here, we drain about 10 acres into it. Uh, and we decided to do this project on this site uh, to try and uh, mitigate uh, flooding uh, downstream. Um, the city's role in this is uh, we helped establish and, and work with the county to uh, secure the site. And um, we are going to be maintaining it here on uh, uh, as far as mowing it and and making sure everything stays uh, native the way we want it to. We installed it this summer and they did all the stuff and when they 
when they went to plant it, it was very wet, and then all of a sudden it hit a drought. So we don't know how much of the seed took on, um, but we're hoping uh, if we have to reseed it, we will, and and it'll be nice and green with a lot of native plants. The local residents are, are beneficial in this, and we have not heard any complaints since we put this in. It used to wash out the ditches and driveways and downstream, and we had a lot of uh, gully washers, uh, but we've had two major storms this summer, and it has held back and released slowly the way it was uh, planned to, and we have not had any of that this year. So here we have a, another detention project uh, that was implemented through the Iowa Watershed Approach Project. And, um, you know, this, this project doesn't, you know, is, is sort of like the last project in Kwaski. It doesn't look like it's holding a lot of water, and, and really that's by design. Uh, the less water that's in there means that, that means there's more room for storage capacity. Uh, this particular project drains about six acres. Um, and while that doesn't sound like much, it's 96% effective in reducing flow in in a hundred year rainfall event. So, so you can imagine by putting these out all over the landscape, you're getting, you're basically stopping rainfall from, um, you know, a number of different places that normally would be contributing a lot of water um, that would then lead to flooding for, for the Wapsie River. Um, this particular project was done with a private landowner, um, as are most of the projects um, that were done through this project. Uh, landowners in the upper Wapsie were able to get 90% cost share uh, in implementing, um, so that's a really good deal. Um, and we were able to then, you know, sell those projects to, to landowners that, that much better because we had that 90% that, uh, cost share. Um, and we're able to get really high participation for the project. Um, and we're gonna be able to spend all the implementation dollars in this watershed. So final steps to finish up this project will really just be to seed it down uh, this fall and, um, you know, with a, a good native mix that uh, will benefit pollinators and, and wildlife um, and otherwise that you know this is really about the final the finished project. So once all of these projects are complete um, with, and final designs are in we're, we're going to be able to send that information um, along with Shive Hattery uh, who is our engineering firm that's helping us with the project uh, down to the Iowa Flood Center and they're going to use that information then to model and tell us exactly how much the, the, the agglomerated impact of all of these projects is going to have actually um, on flooding in the Upper Wapsie. So um, overall, uh, by doing all these projects in conjunction with other conservation projects, that's you know really just the first step uh, for the Upper Wapsie WMA in implementing their you know their their plan and uh, and moving forward towards a more resilient watershed and improving water quality. All right. So again, kind of to give a sense of place here where we are, um, Quasquitan there is in the lower portion of the Upper Wapsie River watershed. Um, so at this point, I'll invite Ross, Tori, Dan, and Luke to go ahead and unmute and uh, turn on your camera so folks can see you. So I know uh, it was mentioned a couple times that there are a few other projects going on uh, within this watershed. Ross or Tori, can you help kind of guide us through what those different projects are and, and maybe where they're located here using this next image? Yeah, so there's actually um, uh, 28 different projects uh, in the watershed. And um, maybe to back up a little bit, we'll just kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, of all the watersheds that you saw that are part of the IWA project, those were selected um, based on um, environmental um, and um, um, low to moderate income unmet need uh, because the source of the funding for this IWA project is from housing and urban development. Um, and it was routed through to the state through Iowa Economic Development Authority. And so uh, because of the source of the funding, um, that was, there was a specific set of criteria related to unmet need during uh, 2013 and 14, I believe. Um, and um, and those, that criteria was used to select the, the watersheds that are a part of the project. And then within that, um, more specifically, the HUC 12s that were then eligible uh, to receive the funds. And so, you know, we talk about working upstream, you know, the, the upstream upper parts of the watershed to have the most effect, particularly on flood reduction. Um, and yet, you know, here we are with projects in sort of the middle part of the, the, the upper Wapsie Pennington watershed. But um, 
So that's kind of how that came to be. So within these HUC 12s, then, you know, we work with landowners that are, you know, in upper parts of the watershed, but also, um, you know, Oxbow restoration was a really um, popular practice for us in this watershed. So we worked with a lot of landowners right along the river. Um, and, and those are going to pro prove to be really uh, nice projects for us. We actually came into this project um, through a little bit different route than some of the other coordinators. If you, if you tune into some of the other, um, you know, IWA projects that are going on around the state. Um, so we were originally came on as administrators. Um, our organization, Northeast Iowa RCD, came on as administrators and then also as the planning team that put together the, the watershed plan for, for the Upper Wapsie uh, WMA. Um, the coordinator that was hired originally for this project got and took a different position um, about a year ago. And so there was a number of projects that were sort of in the hopper at that point in time. Um, Tori and I were able to kind of uh, jump in and, and pick up the baton for those projects and then find additional projects to, uh, to uh, fulfill the funding for the implementation dollars that were available for this watershed. And, and uh, it looks like we're hopefully we'll be able to get all those dollars spent provided um, you know, we can get everything constructed in the next year. So everything is scheduled at this point to be bid out and constructed by the end of 2021. Um, and that's a pretty rigid timeline. So we're hoping that next year is another good construction season and, and uh, we can see all these projects have a maximum benefit for, for the watershed and the surrounding area. Yeah, thanks Ross for reminding me. Yes, this is the first of a series. Uh, we'll be visiting five of these WMA projects across the state, um, kicking it off here with Upper Wapsie. There was a question that has come in um, specific about the, the landscape here. Are there any karst landforms or bedrock um, in this particular part of the area that you're working in um, or what areas that you do work in and are those problematic from an environmental standpoint? So this watershed specifically does not have any karst in it. It all lies within the Iowan surface. And um, it's, it's you know, I think it's like 72% uh, row cropped acres. So a lot of really, you know, high value land. Um, you know, there was, you know, that's where, you know, you think you might run into some issues in terms of, um, you know, landowner buy-in because of that, um, but, you know, there was a ton of interest in this watershed um, from from a landowner perspective, especially I think the you know the ninety percent cost share helped with that. Um, I know that we did help with the planning for the Upper Iowa watershed, um, and you know not to, to go too far down that, and that is primarily karst in that watershed. And, and yes, that does pose a little bit different approach to some of the uh, similar types of practices in terms of detention, but um, not something that we really had to worry about in this watershed. So we will be featuring the Upper Iowa a little bit later this year. Um, so we can definitely dive into that karst impact on some of the design considerations. All right, um, I'm gonna toss this one to Tori here. Uh, can you explain the difference between a pond, a wetland and an oxbow restoration in the context of this project? Like why you chose one approach over another at a particular site, um, especially the difference between a pond and a wetland? Yeah, so mainly it was up to the landowner. Um, they had the first choice on what they kind of wanted to improve their land. Um, so a farm pond has got a deeper pool is the main difference between a pond and a wetland. Pond is more, has a deep pool about six feet or more, whereas a wetland is at full capacity is probably more like three to six or even less than that. So that's the main difference. Um, Again, the goal for this product was flood reduction. So we tried to have a lot of the practices have some flood storage in them. So I know Luke and Dan will probably get more into that, but um, about kind of those design aspects, but they are all designed to hold water. Um, so that way you have some flood reduction in them. That's actually a perfect segue that I'll toss to Luke or Dan to answer this next one. Uh, for the ponds, how much flood reduction storage do you plan for? Uh, can you relate it to inches of runoff from the pond to the wa from the watershed into the pond, and then how quickly does it release that storage water? Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, so I think the uh, short answer on that is it depends. Uh, we're we're working with uh, with these sites that each site contains 
lots of different variables that we're designing towards. Um, in, a, in a perfect scenario, we have a site that affords, uh, affords us a lot of uh, available storage and temporary storage for water to, to pond up and then get released over a period of time. Ideally, we, want, we would like to see uh, seven plus inches of watershed uh, rainfall that's delivered to the site to be stored and then released over a period of time, say 24 plus hours um, that that water is slowly metered off the site and on downstream after the peak flows have, have gone away. But what, what we often find is that uh, an interested landowner comes, comes to us with a, a piece of property. Uh, they're interested in a prax, practice and, and we identify then uh, how much watershed is coming to this point and what is reasonable or what, what uh, is the available storage on site and then we back calculate and say, okay, well, how can we make this available storage the most effective at reducing peak flows and, and downstream runoff? And, uh, and then really try to optimize the design uh, for the list of variables. And, and ultimately the answer is it depends based on watershed, based on the size of the practice itself um, and, and a lot of variables. So I'm going to toss this one back to Ross or Tori. Um, first off, can you let the folks that aren't as familiar know what a WASCOB is? What does that stand for? And uh, how does it compare to ponds and wetlands? So WASCOB stands for Water and Sediment Control Basin. Um, and so what they are is a lot of the times they're just small dry basins that only hold back water after a large rainfall event. A lot of times they're paired with grass waterways. Um, so that way they, they kind of have a, it's just kind of a small berm look along uh, perpendicular to grass waterways. And a lot of times they're multiple in a row. And so that way it kind of has like a step or dam feature to it. A lot of people refer to them as like a gully block. That's another more um, you know, simple term for them. Another thing I was gonna point out too is two of the ponds pond projects that we have on here um, are actually going to be on road detention structures. So um, same concept as a pond, but the detention structure or the dam that you would typically think of is actually going to be the road. And so for those projects, we're working directly with the um, Buchanan County uh, Road Department and supervisors. Um, and then with the up the adjacent private landowners there. Um, and so the, the cool thing there is that, um, you know, it helps protect not only that infrastructure there with the road, um, it has flood protection for, you know, that's that spot, that small little watershed, and then also any subsequent infrastructure below that. So um, that's kind of a unique um, detention practice, I guess, that we're trying to implement in this part of the state. Are you measuring any of the infield practices within the watershed as well to complement these larger structures or edge of field practices? You mean like cover crops? Um, no till like that. nutrient yes, no. management. Yeah. So at this point, um, that was not an eligible practice to be implemented through the Iowa Watershed Approach Project as far as the implementation dollars. However, um, through the hydrologic modeling that is being done by the Iowa Flood Center, um, they were able to add a scenario um, basically to show you know, what the potential flood reduction if you were to do cover crops and no-till on all the available acres, in other words, all the row crop acres in the watershed. Um, and there was a really significant uh, reduction if you were able to do it on every acre. Obviously that's not um, feasible, but it's just kind of for demonstration, like here's the maximum potential you could reach probably with cover crops and no-till. Um, and that's definitely something, you know, the, the upper Wapsie wants to prioritize, you know, recognizing that, you know, these are, these are spending projects, you know, this is a, 28 projects and, and a couple representing a couple million dollars of investment. Um, this is not the only solution. This is an effective solution, but it has to be paired with those infield practices as well. So that's definitely something that we'll be prioritizing as we go forward. So I'm going to toss this one to Luke and Dan because I think it has partly to do with how it's designed, but what's the expected lifespan of these projects that are being implemented? 
Um, I can take that one. Um, so uh, when a landowner is interested in a practice like this, they'll, um, after we go through the design process, which I'll talk a little bit about, about further, when they um, go ahead and pay their 10%, there is a maintenance agreement that's that goes along with that. And I believe the term of that is 30 years. Does that sound right, Tori? Um, but as far as the life expectancy, if they're um, well maintained and um, kept kept seeded, they should last um, quite a long time. I would say 30, 50 plus years, um, depending on um, the situation. But the goal is that they're they're essentially on the landscape um, indefinitely. Um, but maintenance is a big piece of that. So. Back, I guess, to Toria Ross, um, there was a comment that there's a nice mix of practices that are planned and being implemented. As you're working with landowners, was it, there are some practices that were more difficult to encourage or sell uh, compared to others when working with these landowners? I would say we didn't really have to sell the particular practices. Um, it was really up to what the landowner wanted and they approached us in most cases. Um, and a lot, we found that a lot of farmers or landowners wanted that pond that they could maybe fish out of. Um, and so that wasn't always, it didn't always correlate with the goals of the grant project, but we were able to get a lot of them um, that could both fulfill what the landowner wanted and the goals of the grant. Yeah, I'd add to that, uh, Tori, that uh, Liz, we had a lot of really great landowners in the watershed that said, uh, hey, uh, Ross and Tori, uh, upper WAP CWMA, we want to do our part, and uh, but we don't know what that is. So can you guys take a look at our property? Here is where we own property in the watershed. Can you review it and uh, tell us what you guys think? And so that that was is really an ideal situation. Um, our group is able to come together, look at, analyze the property, analyze the constraints, um, and and different, uh, as, as people well know, different areas on the landscape uh, work better with different practices. Um, and so some of those areas that were down um, and flat and close to maybe a floodplain area or uh, at the bottom of a watershed, maybe a, uh, a wetland worked well in those scenarios uh, because we were able to build a, a low berm and have some shallow excavation and uh, and wetlands worked well in other areas maybe valley walls were steeper and uh, and a pond worked better um, and then you have uh, a, the variety of different things there some uh, producers uh, were in more of an ag uh, setting and we're looking at uh, in field practices like uh, grass waterways and wascobs um, and so we, we had a, a good number of people come to us and say, hey, we want to do our part. What's the best for the watershed? Take a look at our, our uh, property and let us know. Excellent. So what are some of the lessons that have been learned um, in designing and constructing and implementing these practices within the watershed? Yeah, so um, maybe we can uh, take a quick opportunity to, to discuss what that, uh, what that design looks like and, and Shive Hattery's role in the project. Um, so I guess um, uh, my name is Luke and I'm an engineer with Shive Hattery as well as Dan. Um, Shive Hattery is a multidisciplinary engineering and architecture firm. Um, we're headquartered in Cedar Rapids office or Cedar Rapids, Iowa and Dan and I uh, both work on the water resources group in our Des Moines office. Um, and our group really focuses on uh, surface water resources. So uh, lakes and dams, ponds, uh, streams and rivers, uh, wetland projects, stormwater, uh, flooding, uh, these types of projects. Um, and our role in this project uh, is to work with the, the upper Wapsie WMA as the as the designer. So Ross and Tori are, are working as the watershed coordinators, really handling the primary landowner contacts, boots on the ground, um, out in the watershed, 
and Shive Hattery, after those initial contacts are made, uh, worked to design the practices. And maybe, Dan, you could outline uh, what our role as the engineer and what, uh, what responsibilities and, and duties we, uh, we performed as part of that, a part of that. Sure. Um, so like Luke said, when, uh, Ross and Tori had identified a landowner that was interested, um, we would typically take a look at their property. Um, maybe they had something in mind and maybe they wanted a pond or, or maybe like Luke said, they were just interested in, um, whatever we could possibly recommend. So um, kind of that review of the property in the watershed that um, is draining through or to um, a property is kind of step one um, to determine um, potentially how much water has come into that site and what the potential is to hold that water back and temporarily um, store it. Um, uh, another thing that we typically like to look at is in a lot of these areas, they're agricultural. So we'll look at um, if there's any field tile. So we lean pretty heavily on the landowners to identify um, what tile is out there um, and where it's located. Um, uh, so from there, um, we've identified potentially a practice that would work um, looking at those factors and we um, create a model to simulate rainfall um, and runoff and the water delivery to that site and to that practice. Um, and then uh, based on the amount of water that's coming to it and the size of the structure, we're able to kind of optimally size the outlet structure, um, whether that's a, um, in some of our bigger wetland sites, we use a sheet pile weir, um, which is a, a, a steel wall with, where the water cascades over the, over the weir. Um, and a lot of our smaller projects use like a, a corrugated metal pipe. Um, so we look at sizing that um, accordingly to maximize uh, the amount of water that we can temporarily hold, temporarily hold back for, um, to provide those flood benefits. Um, so that's kind of our initial design process. We, we prepare a, a, a drawing um, for the landowner as well as a estimated cost opinion um, and give that back to um, Tori and Ross, and they take it um, to the landowner and talk talk it over with them, um, determine if they like the idea, if they are uh, willing to invest that 10% of the estimated cost, um, and uh, essentially just kind of see where they're at with that. Um, so if they are still interested and they're interested in um, the practice we've designed, we initiate a bunch of field work um, that um, is required to get these practices permitted. Um, so that can include uh, wetland delineations, cultural resources investigations, um, land surveying if we need to, um, soils investigations, um, et cetera, to just kind of guide our design and um, make sure we've made good assumptions um, in that preliminary um, estimate. Um, so from there, we prepare, prepare full um, engineering documents for the practice, um, as well as go through a permitting process that includes um, local and local um, permits, county permits, um, Iowa DNR, um, whether it's floodplain or a uh, dam safety permit, um, Army Corps of Engineers for um, any wetland impacts or um, water quality impacts um, to the that the structure will have. Um, and then also there's a housing and urban development um, review process uh, to make sure that uh, these projects meet the meet the goals of the of the grant and then um, basically make sure that all we've uh, checked all the boxes for um, clearances to build the build the structure um, and then we also provide um, services throughout construction um, after they um, bid the project. So these project projects are all publicly bid. Um, and the, uh, we award it to a contractor, uh, the lowest lowest bid for a, a specific bid package, um, which might have two or anywhere from three, four, five um, or more projects um, all wrapped together into one. Um, so after it's bid, uh, we provide construction services, which will include um, surveying and layout, um, staking in the field. Um, we work with the contractor to answer any of their questions, um, assist with any changes that might might come up um, based on unforeseen conditions that are encountered. 
um, and just make sure that um, these structures are getting built the way they were um, designed. So that's that's a quick overview of the of the process that we go through. Um, and uh, I guess the question um, I wanted to outline that a little bit more before we talked about some of the lessons learned. Um, so that was a that was a pretty long list of of things that um, uh, go through, and it does take a lot of time. So I would say um, one of the biggest lessons learned or challenges associated with this was um, managing that timeline um, and managing the landowner's expectations. Um, oftentimes, you know, a landowner would come to us and we'd put a concept together, and they'd say, "Yeah, I like it. Let's do it. When are we going to build it?" Well, it it takes quite a bit of time um, between that concept phase to when we're actually seeing practicing uh, hitting the ground. So managing those expectations and then also managing um, the goals of uh, the watershed um, with the goals of the landowners. Because um, oftentimes uh, landowners, like you said, would potentially want a pond, um, whereas the WMA is more interested in flood storage. Um, so ponds are and specifically a pond that can hold fish. Um, ponds uh, need to be about 10 feet deep to really um, uh, sustain a fish population through winter. Um, and that uh, oftentimes means that we would have to perform a big excavation um, to get a pond that deep. Well, an excavated pond doesn't um, provide any temporary storage for water unless we build up an embankment downstream of that pond where we can temporarily store water. Um, so that was that was difficult um, for some landowners because some sites, um, which, you know, another challenge is we have to balance the earthwork. Um, so it, if, we, if we're going to build a berm, um, typically where we would borrow those soils are from the pool. Um, and maybe just depending on the topography, maybe the borrow for that particular pool, maybe we could only get six or eight feet of depth um, while the landowner wants a 15 plus foot uh, deep pond. Um, and, you know, that's would represent a lot more earthwork um, that potentially isn't a wise use of WMA funds um, in terms of flood reduction. So trying to balance, um, you know, keep landowners interested and balance uh, everyone's goals was also a challenge. All right. So I know, um, Luke, did you have some design concepts you wanted to share to kind of give a sense of what those um, particular sites were that we saw in the video and how they were constructed? Sure, Liz. Um, so uh, we have some uh, plans on hand here that if there are some questions that came up, we could bring up, I'll work to share my screen here and uh, um, and we can maybe talk through. As, as Dan mentioned, uh, one of the primary roles as the engineer for the project was to produce um, uh, design and produce construction documents. Uh, so Shive Hattery is the engineer, but not the contractor on the project. So after uh, I mean, we're talking about a lot of partnerships here uh, today uh, with the uh, Upper Wapsie WMA, Tori and Ross with Northeast Iowa RCND. We talked about uh, landowners, uh, the county, um, lots of stakeholders here. Um, we, as the engineer, when we're finished, we produce a set of documents that then are bid out uh, through a public bid process to contractors. and. And uh, the contractors are the ones that actually construct the practice. And so um, as part of our role as engineer, we're putting together the documents that show the contractor uh, how to construct it. And, and really one of the big, uh, the big components of, of the design and the construction documents is, is quantifying, um, identifying and quantifying all of, all of the scope that it takes to build uh, say a pond and uh, to construct it and then identify um, maybe in those bid items, for example, there is uh, embankment fill and topsoil stripping and there's pipe that goes in 
um, and there's maybe some fencing that needs to get, get reworked for the project and there's seeding when you're done and maybe some tree clearing and so the construction documents are going to outline all of those items and what the quantity how much dirt needs to be moved and how much topsoil needs to be stripped uh, so that contractors can bid on the project and and uh, as an as an example here on my screen is is uh, a pond project um, that is uh, is about to get constructed here. Um, they're they're just working on mobilizing to the site on this particular one, where we have an embankment uh, that runs this direction, crossing a valley, and the blue line is the proposed uh, pool area. And and Dan mentioned here a, just a, a minute or two ago that. Um, that embankment, embankment needs to get constructed and, and the plan sheet that I'm showing here is a cut and fill plan, which shows the contractor where they're borrowing the material and how thick a material they're excavating out, uh, depicted by the red on here. And the blue areas are where they're placing the material in fill for the embankment. And so you can see here, uh, according to this table, it looks like uh, the tallest embankment fill area is 10 to 12 feet and the deepest cut uh, in the inside of the pond is also um, almost 10 foot deep of excavation in one point of the pond so that when all this material gets borrowed out of here and placed here, we end up with a, um, with a really nice pond and then an embankment where the water can bounce up when we have a rain event the water can store up behind this pond uh, four feet deeper than normal and then over the course of time slowly meter out through um, through the outlet structure so again um, this is a cross section through the embankment uh, with this being the embankment and the pool being on this side of the uh, on this side of the screen and then a pipe in this scenario, this has got a 15 inch pipe that goes through the embankment um, uh, where water is slowly released uh, during a larger rain event. Um, and so uh, I guess, Liz, um, that kind of runs through uh, some of the typical plans. We also outline and, and detail different things like uh, a core trench or a wave bench along the shore, et cetera. Um, but those are those are some of the uh, types of things that go into the project design and then ultimately uh, the construction documents which are used uh, uh, by the contractors to construct the practices. In the case of the site there in, in Kwaski, what was the land use before the wetland was put in? Maybe I'll toss that one back over to Ross and Tori. What was there prior to the to the wetland? It was just um, a grass area, grassy area um, owned by the county in the city. So. Yeah, so I believe I'm sharing my screen again, <laughs> um, if you guys can see it. Um, uh, this building is the secondary roads shop uh, for Buchanan County. And that wetland site um, was placed right here on this, uh, this lot that was owned partially by the city of Kwaski and uh, partially by uh, the county secondary roads group. And, and uh, so the Kwaski uh, uh, wetland project, that was the first uh, location shown on the video is right here. And, and generally uh, water flowed from the site over here down off of these buildings uh, down uh, to the west here towards the road and then went underneath the road in a culvert and on downstream. Uh, Going to zoom out here on downstream through the city of Quasquiton and to the uh, the upper Wapsie River. And uh, um, again, this project worked to stop flows from the watershed up here, the watershed right here and hold them on site before moving on uh, downstream. And interestingly enough, so, you know, Kwaski is a river town right on the Wapsie, um, but a lot of their issues with flooding are derived from overland flow um, from, from this area and then also from the Northeast um, kind of section there. 
and not from the river itself. So um, they've kind of addressed a lot of those, some of those issues, but they still have, um, you know, problems with, with some of that overland flow. And so this, you know, like Chad mentioned in the video, um, this is going to help help out a lot um, for them, and and hopefully uh, some of the residents will will see a difference than in some of these heavy rainfall events. Yeah, and to, to add on to Ross's item there, um, uh, Kwaski sits down uh, kind of in a flat area um, up above the Wapsi River, um, which does present some flooding challenges, but uh, they also receive a lot of flow from uh, upstream that comes down, uh, comes downstream towards them and uh, um, and then hits town, but uh, but things are pretty flat uh, down here along the river and where Kwaski is. And, and so when things are flat and you've got a lot of water to, to work through, um, it doesn't take much water to start ponding up and, and creating some issues. And, um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a, a good point by uh, Ross, interesting observation and, and uh, challenge that uh, Kwaski has. So I think I've got one more question here. Um, what was the seed or how was the seed mix determined and what was in it? Um, Is that, that could be a follow up question too. <laughs> I can, I can uh, attempt, attempt to answer that. So uh, we have uh, generally uh, three different types of seed mixes that we've used on these projects. One of those is a, um, a brome grass seed mix. It's just brome grass. And the reason or the use of that seed mix is essentially for those steeper embankment slopes. Um, so brome grass is a really hardy, easy to establish, quick to establish um, grass, and it helps uh, reduce any erosion uh, that can occur on those slopes. Um, the other uh, main seed mix that we are using is a, uh, a native mix. Um, and I would have to, uh, we have an environmental scientist in, in our office here that uh, is a plant, plant uh, guru. Um, and he could probably list off uh, everything that's in that for you, but it, the list is uh, pretty long. It's um, native grasses and uh, native Forbes uh, mix that we um, worked with uh, the UNI Prairie Center for this area um, to help develop. Um, and then the other mix that we've used, and this is mostly landowner preferences, is some, some landowners like to um, retire some of the land, maybe around a pond or a wetland that they've, they're have they going to build, and they'll um, do a, just a, a hay mix. So we've done some uh, Timothy uh, orchard grass type uh, hay mixes uh, for some landowners as well. All right, uh, so this one's specific for wetlands, um, and I guess open it up to the to anyone that wants to answer it, uh, did you select any of the sites for restoration based on historic wetland loss, or was it primarily primarily based on landowner interest and site availability? I think the yeah. ox, the Oxbow wetlands were especially um, tried to be located in places that you can I mean you can visibly see uh, where there was an Oxbow there at one point, you know which obviously is an area where the river channel used to be at one point. That's why, that's what an oxbow is. Up. Um, and so those areas have been, you know, repurposed or and in most cases have been disconnected completely from the river. And in, in a river like the Wapsi, um, you know, the floodplain in a, in a completely natural scenario would have those oxbows where when the river comes up, the water goes into those um, and, and that provides storage by, by allowing the river to kind of get out and breathe and spread out like it should in the flood. Um, and because it's kind of uh, been narrowed up and those, some of those areas have been disconnected, um, that means that all that water that's going through the river is going down at a higher rate and then a higher volume. And so um, by reconnecting with some of those traditional oxbow areas that were already there uh, with a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, excavation basically, that helps. That helps a lot um, with the with the wetland location there. All right. So if you've got any more questions, feel free to get those submitted. I'm going to share my screen one more time. Um, if you attended today's web uh, virtual field day, excuse me, 
for CCA credits, uh, you can send those to me uh, by 5 p.m. today. I'll also put this in the chat box so you can get it there. And I hope you can join us for our next virtual field day, which just so happens to be next week on Tuesday at one o'clock, and it's incorporating sorghum into the Iowa crop rotation. So you can mark your calendars now. Um, we do have quite a few virtual field days coming up and we hope that you can join us. So I'll see if there's been any more questions as I enter my information there in the chat box. I guess I have one final question. Um, you mentioned sending the information about what's been in, implemented uh, down to the Iowa Flood Center um, to estimate the impact, but will there be ongoing monitoring uh, to measure, measure that actual impact and performance moving forward? So the information that we, um, you know, that we get back from the Iowa Flood Center um, will be shared on the the Upper Wapsie WMA website, which is upperwapsieriver.org, or just upperwapsie.org, I'm sorry. And, uh, and that is also the location of the, the overall watershed plan. And so that will kind of be, be included in there. And then, you know, you can see um, you know, the other goal, the goals of the Watershed Management Authority and some of the other practices that, um, you know, are a priority for the WMA. And, and hopefully we can, um, you know, continue monitoring monitoring the progress of the WMA and, and uh, you know, from their standpoint, this is really just kind of the beginning of their work, recognize that this is a long-term process of uh, building resilient landscapes. And I, I shared those links there in the chat box. So if you're curious about the Iowa watershed approach or more about the Upper Wapsie in particular, you can find those links there. Um, and again, the recording of this virtual field day will be available in the evaluation that will be coming this afternoon. So again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, you can find contact information for Ross and Tori, um, and they can help connect you with Luke or Dan. Um, if you have specific questions following today's event by visiting that website, upperwapsie.org. And uh, thank you again, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Liz.